Amen. How's everybody doing today? Good to have you in the house. Amen. Let's give Jesus a big hand clap of praise. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. I brought out the gloves today. <laughs> Figured it was one of those days. You'll see what I mean. <laughs> well, you might as well look at your neighbor. For the fifth week in a row, say, neighbor, it looks like I'm always going to look better than you. Hallelujah. We're just having fun, you know. My dad always said, if you don't toot your own horn, no one else will. Can someone grab that? Thank you. Well, praise God. Oh, the Holy Spirit is moving mightily in this church, in this city, in this country. Last night, we had an amazing time of prayer, gathering together, praying in the Holy Spirit. If you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, my goodness, you need to get baptized in the Holy Spirit today in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. We are a church that believes in the infallible Word of God. If you are offended today, you are not offended with me. You are offended by God's Word. Because I'm not going to give you one scripture, or two, or three, or four, or five, or six, or seven. We're going to give you a bunch. My sermons are basically just a bunch of scriptures with a little talking in between. I don't need anybody's opinion. I need the Word of God. I don't need speculation. I need truth. You know, Charles Spurgeon made an interesting quote one time. He said, unity can only be accomplished when the truth is compromised. That's kind of an odd statement, but I knew what he was saying. That you can see that the world we live in wants to stomp out truth, and if we were to just compromise and be tolerant of all things, then there would seem to be more unity. But unity in regards to sacrificing truth is deception. It's not unity. And today we are on Revelations chapter 8. We've gone verse by verse through chapters 1 through 7 thus far. And today we are on chapter 8. But before we get into chapter 8, I think it would be good to give you some exciting news. Well, at least it's exciting to me. It's terrifying to most people. <laughs> and that's where I find myself, that I'm getting so excited at what people consider to be the most terrifying news. And the reason I'm excited is because, yes, if you're not a believer, the end times are terrifying. But if you're a believer, it's the blessed hope. And, you know, I don't know how many of you have, you know, been watching or, or paying attention or if you read much of what has been taking place at the Global Economic Forum. And they have one every year. And their next one is the beginning of 2021. I believe it's in January, but the past one that they just had... They spent the majority of their time talking about something called the Great Reset. And it's a, not really anything new. It's been something they've been working towards for a long time. If you've been here for you know, any length of time, we talked about how the UN adopted a 10-point policy given by Alice Bailey on how to basically take Christianity out of America and the world. And all nine points have been met, and the tenth is being met as we speak. 
It's to make these changes and to get the church to agree with these changes. And we got a bunch of churches that aren't really churches. They're whores. That's a biblical term, so don't get offended. Okay, know your Bible, Revelations. Know that there is a false religious system that is riding on the beast. And let me tell you how bad the false church is. (laughs) They're so stupid and dumb and ignorant and powerless and petty that the Antichrist can't even stand them. The Antichrist destroys them. The false, the, the, the harlot, the whore of Babylon. See, they spend three and a half years trying to get all buddy buddy and, you know, they want to be in the right. They want everybody to like them and everybody to accept them. They want to agree with all kinds of demonic teaching and immorality, but after three and a half years, the Antichrist destroys them. See, the devil will only use you as long as you're going to serve his purpose, and then if you're not going to go on and serve you, he'll just destroy you, get rid of you. So the Great Reset, which is, you know, it's interesting. The devil has so much pride that he'll tell on himself. And this is not speculation. This is like fact. This is like from their mouth. That's what I love. I've just been sitting around laughing as I read this stuff. And Lisa would be like, what are you laughing about? Like, this stuff's ridiculous. And it says their opportunity, the Global Economic Forum said for the Great Reset, as we enter a unique window of opportunity to shape the recovery... Now notice, this was all because of what? (laughs) COVID-19. A virus that's not even as powerful as the flu. A virus that is smaller than the holes on your mask. And for anybody listening live, go look it up. My father-in-law is a PhD in chemistry. I'll take that over your GED. (laughs) Not anything against GED. You got to get it. (laughs) I'm just telling you. Everybody's standing up for something that doesn't work just like they'll stand up for the Antichrist and he won't work. Oh, yeah. Am I, am I comparing? No, I'm calling things like precursors. So as we enter a unique window of opportunity to shape the recovery, this initiative will offer insights to help inform all those determining the future state of global relations. The direction of national economies, the priorities of societies, the nature of business models, and the management of global commons. Drawing from the vision and vast expertise of the leaders engaged across the forum's community, the Great Reset Initiative has, set a, has, set, has a set of dimensions to build a new social contract that honors, I love this, the dignity of every human being. They went on to say, COVID-19 has shown us how timid people really are. That's what they said about you. They said that because of people's dutiful obedience, they'll have an easier time taking away power from all people and implementing the Great Reset. Yep. The World Economic Forum also said the following. This isn't hidden. You can get on and and look at it. Twitter's not going to suppress this because Twitter's a part of this. One silver lining of the pandemic is that it has shown how quickly we can make radical changes to people's lifestyles. 
Almost instantly, the crisis has forced businesses and individuals to abandon practices long claimed to be essential. I'm giving you just facts. Now, you're going to get maybe offended. I'm not being political. I'm, I'm giving you an introduction to Revelations 8. <laughs> you know. Joe Biden has called the pandemic an incredible opportunity to fundamentally transform the country and that the U.S. needs to have a revolutionary and institutional change. He promised an end to the era of shareholder capitalism. All of this was a response to the pandemic. Now, you need to understand Biden is just a pawn. They, they got to have people they, control, want, they can control. And this is what the Great Reset is all about. The Great Reset is about to be pushed, and it does mirror the Great Tribulation. The system for the beast is about to be ushered out. And many people this year have rolled out the red carpet, fake ID Christians, they've rolled out the red carpet for the Antichrist. This is why I said, like it or not, you were not voting for a president this year. You were voting for a worldview. You can take offense with that, but believe me, you will see that to be true. I 100% know because God's word is telling us where things are headed and where things are now. Now, the plan of the great reset, because I know there might be some in here and there's many all over the world and in, in our country that want to see things change. But you really don't know what they're changing and where they're headed and what they're doing. The, the plan of the Great Reset is to implement change in the following areas. And I'm just naming a few. You can get on. You can look it up for yourself. It is, it is, it is so enormous of a plan that it, it, it would take weeks to just, for you to just sit down and study it. But here are some of the areas. Civic participation artificial intelligence, corporate and agile government, quantum computing, 5G, vaccination, European Union, Russian Federation, global governance, LGBT, they say I inclusion, I don't know what the I stands for, climate change, justice and law, nuclear security, human rights. Those are just a few. But the World Economic Forum which I believe is the Great Reset is another word for New World Order. They're not using that anymore. And so it will produce the following. An end of capitalism, which will completely destroy this country. Socialism has never worked. It'll never work. I like capitalism. I like that there's somebody right now driving around town in a Lamborghini. If there wasn't capitalism, I would never get to see one driving down the road. I don't have enough money to buy one, but I'm thankful someone else does so I can see it on the street. That's the opposite of jealousy. That's celebration. <laughs> you know? What I don't like is people gaining wealth off someone else's pain. And many of the people that were voted for this year have grown their portfolio leaps and bounds through this pandemic. And this great reset will produce the following. An end of capitalism, universal income, canceling of all debt. See, the thing is, you're like, I, don't, I would never do that. What if someone showed up to you today and said, we'll pay off all your debt, but you won't own anything 
we'll own you. They won't say that. Most people would bow down to that idea. Why do you think they've spent so many years getting so many people in debt? Why do you think they send you credit cards every month and your credit score isn't good enough to get one? No, I have people I know in this church because I help them financially. They got a credit card in the mail. I'm like, why are they sending you a credit card? You're living 110% without that. You don't need a credit card. Well, they'll slave you into debt. You know how many credit cards have gone through the roof this year? People aren't even paying their credit cards. Is that just a coincidence? That let's, let's destroy the economy, get everybody to skyrocket their debt, and then bring great relief by saying, we'll cancel all your debt. But you got to take the vaccine. This isn't conspiracy, guys. This isn't the Alex Jones podcast. (laughs) We're not, you know, chasing down random code. This is happening right before our eyes, but everybody is so busy looking at the wrong thing. See, they got you looking at the masks, and the protests and the riots and they're behind the screen. <laughs> You're not even paying attention. Distraction is the key element of all combat. And then you get offended when someone comes and brings the truth. Especially before, you know, in April, they're trying to shut down the churches. That's stupid. You're just saying that. And I'm going to tell you one big reason why the ruling in Kansas was what it was to our churches, because what we did in the spring. And there were a few other churches, not very many. They're all wanting to be courageous now because they can't pay their bills. So courage isn't principle. It's survival. So, you will have end of capitalism, universal income, canceling of all debt, the acceptance of all vaccines, a health passport, digital IDs, there will be an end of private property, you'll own nothing and be happy, at least that's what they say. And there will be a reduction, a great reduction of the world population. Interesting, a lot of old people have died this year. Hmm. But the youth have remained vibrant. You'll see this in 2021. They're raising up an army of youth to go to 400 cities to promote this great reset. It's on, you can look it up. Now, I know what you're saying. Well, I mean, there's not a whole lot of people behind this great reset. I'll name you a few. I don't have time to name them all. It would take more than two hours to name all the names. But I'll give you some. The people that are partnering with the Great Reset. Alibaba, Amazon, Apple, Bank of America, Barclays, Bayer, Bloomberg, Bill Gates Foundation, Boeing, Chevron, China Energy Investment, China Southern Power Grid, Cisco, City, CVS, Dell, Discovery, Equifax, of the devil, European Investment Bank. (laughs) Facebook, Future Fit AI, Goldman Sachs, Google, Gulfstream, Heineken, Hitachi, HP, Humana, Huawei, Hyundai, IBM, Islamic Development Bank, Johnson & Johnson, LG Chemical, LinkedIn, Manchester United, Mary Kay, surprisingly, MasterCard... (laughs) They want those pink Cadillacs, I guess. Mayo Clinic, Microsoft, Mitsubishi Chemical Holdings, NASDAQ, NBC, Netflix, Nestel, New York Times, Nokia, PayPal, Pepsi, Procter & Gamble, Qualcomm, Russian Direct Investment Fund, 
George Soros Fund Management, Stanley, Black & Decker, Coca-Cola, and by the way, this is on their website of their partners. I didn't go to some third, third, see, they're telling on themselves. Coca-Cola, Legos, believe it or not. I was kind of disappointed in that. But I will say I'm excited. I didn't see Taco Bell on here, so I was, I was pretty excited about that. I knew, so I knew, so I knew something right there with the Holy Spirit telling me, you know. <laughs> Toyota, Tyson Foods, Uber, UPS, Visa, Verizon, Volvo, Volkswagen, Walmart, Western Union, Williams, Sonoma. So I'm going to tell you that there's a zillion of these names, these partners, and, and, and to think they already are partnering with this, the World Economic Forum. And like I said, there's, there's hundreds more. So do you really think that you and your 401k stand a chance? Do you like to order on Amazon? Well, have you got the vaccine? Well, you can't order on it unless we know you take the vaccine. You like want to go to a Royals game? You want to go to a Chiefs game? Want to go, go to Walmart? Oh, we'll get you. We'll just make the precursor to what the mark of the beast actually is. No buying, no selling. You're going to take it. We will control you. This has already happened. Ticketmaster have started already implementing this practice that they're putting systems in place that they will not allow people to come to their concerts who have not taken the vaccine. Have you ever seen in the history of our world such forced vaccinations? Never. There's a plan. And you, I'm, I'm hoping, as the young people would say, I hope you're woke. I hope that you're awake and that you realize what's going on before you and that you're not just bowing down and agreeing so that you can keep peace at the dinner table. Peace at the dinner table has caused a lot of people to go to hell. I believe in walking in love. I believe in speaking the truth in love, but I don't believe in lying to people. It harms people. It kills people. And so... For the Christian, the great reset is the rapture. Yeah. Hallelujah. But for the unbeliever, it's the beginning of the great tribulation. And my wife wanted me to tell you this this morning. She always gives me something. Make sure you put this in there, babe. Tell those people. I said, okay, honey. She said, remind the people that things aren't falling apart. They're falling into place. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 So, with the seal judgments not completely over, as we learned last week, we saw, um, well, actually two weeks ago, we, 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 there was a pause, and then there was, the sixth one was open in, in Revelation chapter 6. There was a pause in 7. And the trumpets, or the trumpet judgments, are about to begin. If you could think about it, could I borrow that? Uh, anybody have a piece of paper I could use real quick? Okay, so think of it like this. This helped me. You know, can I have a bigger piece of paper? That's no, too small. You guys, I need it more, more than enough. Thank you for following Jesus. Okay, so imagine seven seals on this scroll. Okay, they're broken one at a time. But you don't know what the scroll says until the seventh seal is broken. When the seventh seal is broken, you can then open up the scroll. 
So you gotta understand and look at the seals in that way. That the scroll was sealed by the Antichrist, with the Antichrist, being the first seal. The man of war, the second seal, right? Then you have death and famine, martyrdom. All these things are happening. A people of nature. And the seventh seal, being broke, opens the way for the seven trumpets of judgment. Okay? The seven trumpets of judgment and the seven bowls of wrath, which we'll read about later, the trumpets and the bowls affect the same things, but the bowls of wrath affect them with greater intensity. Okay? And as these trumpets begin, and like I said, these will be followed by the bowls of wrath, accumulating in the destruction of Babylon and Christ's return to earth. And if you, like I said, if you pay close attention, you'll see these increasing. But today, we're going to look at the first four trumpets. Okay? These are natural in that they affect land, they affect salt water, fresh water, and the heavenly bodies. And the fifth and, and sixth trumpet judgments involve the release of demonic forces that first torment and then kill. And the last of the trumpet judgments in Revelations 11, 15 through 19 creates a crisis among all the nations of the world. The seventh trumpet makes way for the seven bulls. Okay? So let's read <clears throat> Revelations chapter 8. Verse 1, it says, when the lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, there was silence throughout heaven for about half an hour. Now notice, there's been a lot, we've read a lot about a lot of praise going on around the throne, a lot of worshiping, there's been a lot of noise. And this is the first that we read about a silence. And suddenly all the music stops, the singing and the shouting stop around God's throne. And the silence is kind of like a sort of a, a dramatic pause that captures the attention of everyone in heaven. If there's a lot of noise going on and all of a sudden there's... Great silence. People know something has happened. And at this point, there seems to be a completely overwhelming sense of the seriousness of what is about to take place. The Lord is about to directly take a divine step into human history and unleash his judgment on the earth. That's something. Something that over 2,000 years, nothing. And in one day, we're going to begin to see the unleashing of these judgments. Because up till now, if, you, if you've been here, the, the primary attention, and if you download the Nexus app, you can go back and listen to all these. You need to understand the book of Revelation. There's a blessing attached to understanding it and reading it and knowing it. But up till now, the primary attention of John's vision has been, directly, has been directed towards God's throne and the person and events surrounding it. But the breaking of the seventh seal, the scroll can be unrolled. Its contents are now fully revealed. And from this point on, John's attention will turn to earth and the horrors of judgment that are about to overtake it. Hallelujah. 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 Hmm. Anybody in here, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. You have an, an organ problem with one of your organs. Anybody? Lift your hand if you do. Right here. Anybody else? Hallelujah. 
in the back there. Hallelujah. Any liver problems, anybody? Any? Anybody with liver problems? Anybody at all? Hallelujah. For those in here, you lift your hand about some kind of problem, whether it's doctor have said, but stand to your feet, and I want to pray over you right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stretch your hands towards these people. Father God, right now in Jesus' name, I speak complete healing over every organ in their body in Jesus' mighty name. Healing now. Healing now in Jesus' name. Sickness is gone from you. Oh, for what the enemy tried to set up to destroy this body, it shall be renewed in Jesus' mighty name. Oh, hallelujah. We thank you, Father, that healing is ours. It belongs to us. By the stripes that were laid upon Jesus' back, we are healed. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Your body's lining up with God's word as we speak in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, we thank you that the blood of Jesus covers their body. It covers their life. Oh, we command every body part to line up with the word of God. Divine healing taking place right now in Jesus' mighty name. Your word says that healing is the children's bread. And we thank you, Father, right now. Great and mighty healing. Oh, thank you, Lord. Just let it overtake you today. Oh, he's healing you, every part. No fear, no worry. Healing is yours now. Oh, we thank you, Father, right now for your healing power. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Well, praise God. See, that's how that goes. You know, just to give you some clarity, everybody, um, you know, I've been around a lot of great men of God who, when the Lord directs them to pray for somebody, there's different ways they know the Lord tells them. You know, Brother Ted Shellsworth says it's like a movie film playing in front of them. I've never had that. I actually, I don't, I, I don't get the movie film. I actually get a pain in my body. So like, as I was preaching, I just got this pain. The other, I don't remember weeks ago, I prayed over people who were having horrible migraines. Just right in the middle of the sermon, I just... But after I pray for people, it goes away. And it's the Lord directing you. There's somebody in here that needs healing. And you know why you sit there and say, well, this is great. Uh, you don't know that what has just happened, it caused someone not to die at 40, but to live till they're 90. Because the healing power of Yeshua. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you can pray for people anywhere. We were at Ikea one day. Victor couldn't move his elbow. It was bothering him. He just was irritated about it. He said, hey, buddy, will you be praying for him? I don't like it when they say, will you be praying? We'll pray right now. Right near the Swedish meatballs. <laughs> I laid my hands on him, and we agreed and prayed the prayer of faith. Your elbow didn't hurt after that. Healing belongs to people. You can call it what you want. I don't feel the need to explain because, you know, if you have someone who's a critic, no matter, they could, you could have an amputee's leg grow back right in front of them and be like, oh, I don't know, there was a green screen or something. <laughs> so, hallelujah. So, Revelations 8 2. Everybody say amen. amen. I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets. Hmm. In the Old Testament, trumpets were a sign of kingly authority and God's activity. 
Now, let me just tell you this. Aren't you thankful that Jesus says it's God's will to heal? And that if you don't believe in healing, then you don't believe in God's word. You can get up. You can get upset. It ain't going to change his word. But I guarantee you, you're going to want it to work when your kid's dying of cancer in front of you. See, there comes a place where the doctors say there's nothing more we can do. And Jesus says, let me take over, Rover. (laughs) Hallelujah. A lot of people in this city get upset when I talk about healing. I mean, get mad. You can't say it's God's will to heal. I'm not. God is. (laughs) Well, I mean, we don't really know if it's his will or not. Yeah, we do. Jesus says, as I am, so is he. Whatever you saw Jesus doing was God's perfect will. Did Jesus ever make anybody sick? Did anybody ever come to Jesus need healing and be like, it's not my will? Even the disciples tried to play games and be like, "Uh, well, is it because their dad's a sinner? He's like, no. This person is that way. God didn't make them that way, but God's going to get glory through the healing that's about to take place. If you couldn't have 100% certainty for healing, you couldn't have faith. It's like saying this. It's almost a Calvinistic belief in regards to healing. How do you have faith that God wants to save you when you only believe he saved some and not all? When he died on the cross for some, how do you know you're in the sum? You know, when you're when in heaven and all eternity, when they were playing duck, duck, dam, how do you know you weren't the dam? You know? So, God's word says it, and that settles it for me. And not only that, I've seen it work thousands of times. But there's people, I guess, that want to believe that God puts sickness on people. God takes people's kids away from them. Yes, there's terrible things that can happen on earth, but we serve a good God. And the problem is religion came along and started to attribute all of these catastrophes to God. Why? So they could give you an explanation of why they happened. Hence, they wanted to control you and put fear in your life. We're the ones that can only hear from God. But healing belongs to you. It belongs to you. I don't know how we're getting that in Revelations 8, but it does. Hallelujah. I'll read it again. I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets. In the Old Testament, trumpets were a sign of kingly authority and God's activity. Trumpets served to announce in the Old Testament important events to give signal in times of war and to sound an alarm. So the seven trumpets... They announce a series of end-time plagues more severe than this world has ever seen. And it's revealed by the breaking of the seals, but not as devastating as what will take place when the bowls of wrath are poured out in chapter 16. Okay? So, verse 3. Then another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar and a great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. You know, this scripture I always have to pause on because the repeated mentioning of the prayers of the saints in Revelation, it indicates 
that the prayers of God's people are extremely important in enacting God's purposes and plan for the destruction of evil and the establishment of true justice and righteousness on the earth. Prayer is serious business. A lot of people think, see, if you just think God's going to heal some, don't pray. If his will's already been decided, why pray? You mean God can will something and it not happen? Yep. Bible says it's God's will that all men be saved and that no men shall perish. Are all men going to be saved? No. But it's his will they be. So the purpose of prayer is not to get man's will done in heaven. It's to get God's will done on earth, even if that involves judgment. Well, verse 4, it's about to go down here in a minute. (laughs) The smoke of the incense... Mixed with the prayers of God's holy people. See, they're giving us parallels from Old Testament, the great atonement. Ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. Then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar, which this is different than what they did in when some, the, the, the atonement, and threw it down upon the earth. Hmm. Wait a minute. Mm-hmm. See, it says, then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar. See, they used to put it on the coals. But it threw it down upon the earth. The thunder crashed, lightning flashed, and there was a terrible earthquake. So the parallel, if you were to go and read Ezekiel 10, indicates that this symbolized God's judgment and the effects described in Revelations 8.5 basically support this view. In short, a storm is about to begin. You know you're in trouble when the angels in heaven start throwing stuff on the ground. And the earth is the ground. Okay. Verse 6. Let's read this. This isn't fiction. This isn't some hobbit movie. Bilbo skirting through the mountains looking for a dumb ring. This is real. This is happening. Nothing can change what is about to take place. The prayers throughout time have been praying for this moment to take place. Every time you've gone to God and prayed that justice will be done. Oh, it got mixed into that pot. Every time this world tramples you down and you lifted up prayers, oh, that prayer wasn't forgotten. It lifted up like incense. Oh, hallelujah. It tells us. Oh, it was mixed. I love it. Mm, Think about it. Great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people. Hmm. The seven angels with the seven trumpets prepared to blow their mighty blasts. The first angel blew his trumpet and hell and fire mixed with blood were thrown down on the earth. One third of the earth was set on fire One third of the trees were burned and all the green grass was burned. So hell and fire mixed with blood 
kind of reminds us of the seventh plague that God sent against Egypt in Exodus 9. But this is to another level. The target of this judgment is green vegetation. The trees and the grass, one third which is burned up. I wonder what they're going to do. What are the environmentalists going to do? They're going to come up with a green new deal. I love seeing them talk about this green new deal. I'm like, oh, your green stuff's about to burn up. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Let me sit on the clouds of glory and watch their face. <sighs> One can only imagine how this will affect the, the balance of nature. The food supply. You know, the Greek word for trees usually means fruit trees. And the destruction of pasture lands, would, it would devastate the, the meat and the, the milk industries. Isn't it funny how in the World Economic Forum, they say in the future, meat will be a luxury. Won't be common. And... Many homes, commercial buildings are also going to be destroyed by this plague. Revelations 8, verse 8 through 9. See, we're just doing it verse by verse. I'm hoping you're understanding this. You understand this? That's been my goal and my mission is to go slowly. How many in here, by lifting your hand, say, I understand Revelations now and I never did before? A lot of people in here. Praise God. That's the goal, is to make something that everybody has told you is complicated, and you'd be like, hey, I can understand this. Of course you can. You're a child of God. What are we? You know, you're acting like you're living under the, the Catholic church where they wouldn't let you read the Bible. You can't understand it. See, they didn't want you to read it. Freedom was in there. Remember the book of Eli? He knew. Denzel Washington knew. <laughs> Denzel Washington goes to Bishop Blake's church. It's a Holy Ghost church. And my dad always say, well, he's making a lot of movies that don't are a Holy Ghost thing, son. I said, I know, Dad. But I sure like that equalizer. You know, if I pictured myself doing that, I'd trip right to start it off. I'd be breathing real. <sighs> <sighs> oh, Denzel. <laughs> Remember that movie, John Q? I'll get crying. I'll start talking about it. He looked at his boy. He was going to kill himself so this boy could have his organs. And he said, son, don't get into the bad things. He said, there's a lot of bad things. He says, stay away from the bad people, son. There's a lot of good people in this world. Stay away from the bad. And that was the last thing he wanted to tell his son. Because, boy, bad people will take you down a bad road. Mess you up. One night can change your entire life. Well, the second angel blew his trumpet, and a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea. One third of the water in the sea became blood. And... <laughs> One third, I'm not trying to laugh, of all living things in the sea died. And one third of all the ships on the sea were destroyed. So this, this mountain 
that's thrown into the sea is evidently appears to be a large meteor that's on fire. And this causes a third of the oceans to become blood in the European Mediterranean area. So turning water into blood kind of reminds us of the first Egyptian plague in Exodus 7. So the tr this trumpet causes a triple judgment. Salt waters turn to blood. A third part of marine life die. And a third of the ships are destroyed. This will be an economic disaster. I mean, consider that the oceans occupy about three-fourths of the earth's surface. And you can imagine the extent of this judgment. I mean, the, the pollution of the water, just that alone, and the death of so many creatures would greatly affect the balanced life in the oceans. And this would undoubtedly lead to, you know, future problems that will, you got to understand, every problem that the trumpets cause and the bowls of wrath cause are unsolvable. There's not enough time. What are you going to do, scrape together? You're trying to solve a problem in the last three and a half years while all hell is breaking loose against you. You couldn't even solve them if you were out on a beach thinking up stuff. You know, they said, you know, don't get together on Thanksgiving. They didn't tell you not to go to the mall. No. Isn't it funny? Quasimodo up in New York had people over for old Kit Kat 19. The California governor was out partying with his friends. The Colorado governor or whoever, he said, you guys don't need to travel anywhere. Same day, jumped on a plane. Suckers. And everybody's like sitting around. Just, you know, just wake up a little bit. Hallelujah. You know, I'm kind of excited today. I haven't had too many people get up. There's only been a few taking the walk of shame up the ramp. <laughs> no, I just, you want people to stay and hear it. Your heart breaks when you see them leave. But you can't change what you speak. Because then everybody else would be in deception so that two people could feel all nice and cozy. You know, in January of 2018, there were 53,753 ocean merchant ships registered. So imagine what happens when 18,000 of those ships and their cargo are suddenly destroyed. Amazon won't be so prime. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, during the Great Tribulation, you're not going to have same-day delivery. I'm just going to tell you. Jeff Bezos... Sorry, man. I know you have a lot of money, but your money can't fix the trumpets. They're going to be blown. Revelations verse 8, verse 10 through 11. Because that would have been bad enough what, what's just happened, right? You have hell, fire, and blood coming down. And then you have a, some kind of mountain meteor thrown into the sea, destroying a third of the water in the sea, becomes blood, third of all living creatures, sea die, third of all ships destroyed. You think that'd be bad enough? I mean, you could have just put those in the Great Tribulation, and I would still be like, that's horrible. No, it's an appetizer. It's calamari. <laughs> then the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from the sky, burning like a torch. See, it's burning, and I believe it's breaking apart. I'd have to ask my father-in-law about this. 
But they say if a star ever hit the earth, it'd destroy. I mean, it'd be bad. It'd destroy the earth. So it has to break up. And you'll see why it's going to break up. A star fell from the sky, burning like a torch. It fell on one-third of the rivers. Wait a minute. Everybody's like, oh, it's just the ocean. We still have our, our Ozarka. Not anymore. <laughs> oh, Dasani, it fell on one-third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star in some translation is Wormwood which it means bitterness. This translation says the name of the star was bitterness, which is what the name means. And, and it made one-third of the water bitter, and many people died from drinking the bitter water. So God's wrath is now reaching inland, and it torches or touches the river and the fountains of water, making the fresh water taste like wormwood. It's bitter. The water sources will become so bitterly polluted that people are going to die just by drinking it. Now, can you imagine not having any water supply? How long are you going to last? Now, see, this is good news. Now, I know you're thinking, that's crazy. Oh, I'm not down here. It's great news for me. This doesn't bother me. Do you think this bothers God? Justice doesn't bother God. He's given this earth plenty of time. But man in their ways lean on their own intelligence thinking they can fix every problem in their mind. See, that's the thing. When you come to God, you have to be at the end of yourself, knowing that you are powerless to save your own life. Only Jesus and the blood he's shed for you can be payment for your sin. That's good to know, that you don't have to be smart, you don't have to be rich, you don't have to be influential to receive Jesus. You don't have to have status or followers in order to enter into the gates of heaven. All you need is the blood of Jesus to cover all your sin. But you know, most people are, I don't have any sin. I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. Why would I need Jesus? Now think, for the first time, Almost in American history, Jesus is now a racist. Someone who died for all of humanity is now a racist. You've never seen so many people. I've never seen in my life. I've been alive for 42 years, and I've never seen people using the F word against Jesus chanting in the streets. They did it this summer. They burned Bibles in the streets this summer. Christians just sat around. Well, they probably thought it was a different book. <laughs> no. Violence. But I'm here to tell you, oh, how thankful you need to be today that if you're not right with the Lord, you have breath. And time. I don't care how mad and upset, whatever you think the result may be, I'm telling you. Guys, you better tell your family and friends. Because I can't really honestly. I don't even know if I was going to make it here today. That's how on the verge I've never felt that way in my whole life. And there are millions of people. Their spirit, see, God's beginning. See, people that are led by the Spirit, they're in unity. You see, they, they, they sense something. I have felt a heaviness more than I ever have. I've never even talked about this. But a heaviness over the last 
especially three weeks. And I didn't, I've just not understood what it was. <sighs> it's not like I'm not depressed. I'm not sad. But it's a heaviness I just feel when I'm going to sleep, when I'm waking up. And I was, Lord, I, help me understand what this is. And there was a great man of God that I, I deeply trust shed some great insight on this for me. He said, what you feel, the heaviness that you feel is, a, is, is the spirit of Jezebel over this country. He said, the spirit of Jezebel is the most vicious Dangerous, demonic spirit there is. It divides churches. It destroys families. But what does, what's the purpose of the spirit of Jezebel? To cause the prophets of God to run in fear. And men of God today, true men of God, just because they have a mic or stand on a stage doesn't make them anything. You can tell if they are or not by what they preach and what they stand on. And they have felt an enormous amount of pressure. That spirit is trying to get them to back down in speaking the truth. You might offend people. I don't know. And, and Lisa and I know this for a fact that when, you, when we start speaking out against these things, the enemy brings an onslaught against us to get us to shut up. A lot of pastors that were once powerful got some hush money. And that's why they just kind of, have you ever noticed some Ministries, man, they were so powerful, and all of a sudden you're like, what happened to them? I mean, they just hush money. Anytime someone shows up with a bunch of money, you need to pray about it. And I'm telling you that this spirit of Jezebel that is over our country, there is right now, there's not a war going on politically. There's a war going on in the heavenlies right this minute. And see, when I understand that, I could care less who I offend. I just want to make sure I'm on the side of light. I'm not thinking I'm on the side of light and fighting against the light. But there is a, enor you got to understand, if you understand the tipping point of where we're at. And you know, the Holy Spirit only lets me say so much. Some weeks, it unfolds more. But there's a lot in my spirit that I see and I know, but God says no. That's just for you to continue to pray about the things that you're seeing, but I'm giving you insight on the things to come. Now, this spirit is going to be broken. And this spirit of Jezebel that has tried to intimidate God's people God's people will end up laughing at that spirit. They tried, the spirit tried to intimidate God's people, but God's people are standing and remaining strong, and God is doing something. Oh, I love it what God does. God's never going to do something when you might kind of sit back and think, well, I don't know if that was really God or not. Oh, you'll know. 
you'll know. Have you ever been doing something, working at something, and, like, and, you, and if God would have done something, you might have taken credit, but there comes a point where you're like, that wasn't me. Wasn't me. But we got to discern the times. That's why coming together on Sundays, hey, this is Thanksgiving weekend. This is supposed to be a down Sunday for the church. Doesn't look like a down Sunday. Looks like people are hungry. The church is coming together. It's rising up in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. And let's not grow weary in well-doing. For in the opportune time, if we do not give up, we shall reap the harvest in Jesus' name. We've been standing on God's word all year long. Do you remember last fall? I remember being in my office. God gave me a word. I came out. I gave it to you. God said that the fall of 2019 shall be a word immersion. Remember that? And we just said we got to get built up in the word. Something's coming and we need the word. So we did a series on called Prosper, which a bunch of people left after that. And we thought, well, hey, let's just do some more. Let's lose some more. Let's do a series the following month on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Whoever does those series back to back? Give it in tongues. And then you remember in January, we said, this is our year for multiplication. What did we do? 21 days. We came in here every morning and prayed. And we had 21 declarations. And we declared them over this church. If you go back and read those declarations and then look at what this year has been, you're going to say, Oh my, oh my. We're not going to die. We're going to thrive in Jesus' mighty name. So, the plague is the result of a great falling star from the sky, it says. That's interesting because Job 9 tells us that God has his stars numbered and named. Hence, God also knows where the star Wormwood is, where it's located, and it'll come down to serve its purpose. And if the people who drink from these waters are in danger of dying, then what's going to happen to the fish? Creatures that live in these waters, or what would happen to the vegetation near these rivers? And you know, to all the tree huggers <laughs> who are worried about the deadly consequences of water pollution today, what are you going to think when this third trumpet blows? I find it humorous. This earth is going to last as long as God wants it to. You know, God, if you think about it, with as many nuclear weapons that are on planet earth right now, that could blow up the planet, I don't know how many times over, and it's not been done. God's purpose is going to come to pass. Nothing can stop it. But I'll tell you this. Don't get sad. Because there's a tendency to feel like you're having a funeral for your life on earth. This is about it. And you know, it's, it's a natural thing. When you think about your life, you think about, you know, hey, there's only so many more trips me and you are going to take to Best Buy. 
And we'll never know, when will that last time be? But you know, I think about the things we've done. And you know, I, I, I'm ready to get out of here. But you know, sometimes there is this unknowing. Kind of makes you, you know, like we have this dog. His name's Champ. He's a, what is he? A she a poo. Shih Tzu and Poodle. And you know, Lisa said, What about old Champ? Old Champ's coming. People say, well, I don't really know if that fits into my doctrine. <laughs> You're telling me that God's building mansions and homes, every desire, and a dog can't get no air bud going in the rapture. <laughs> You're telling me there ain't animals in heaven. There are. It says the sheep gets right up next to the lions, like, eh, eh. Whatever a sheep does, I don't own one. <laughs> but don't get, like, don't let your mind get to something that you'll never understand. Just know it's going to be good. You know, sometimes when I'm with the kids and we're in the car, Dad, where are we going? What, what's it like? Has your daddy ever taken you anywhere it wasn't good? No. It's going to be good. You just wait till we get there. I can't explain it to you, but it's going to be good. See, death is not made for you. Do you know why everybody fights getting old? You weren't made to get old. I, I, I leaned back to Brixton on the way here today. I said, hey, buddy. You're about to enter into the double digits next year. Go from 9 to 10. Are you excited? He said, no, Dad, I'm not. I said, well, why not? He goes, I don't want to get old, Dad. He's nine. <laughs> God, I was like, man, I'm 42, man. What do I mean? <clears throat> and I said, you don't want to get a car and drive? He goes, No. Because I just want to be a kid. And I thought about how in the kingdom we're just a bunch of kids serving the king. And we'll never know death. We'll never know pain. We'll never know sorrow. Think about that. No one's going to be coming by being like, so when did you buy that house? None of that stuff, man. <laughs> Hallelujah. Streets of gold. No one's saying, whose money was this to buy the streets of gold? <laughs> Have you ever thought about how people are with church money, yet the heaven has streets of gold? Can you imagine if I just had one section of this stage paved in gold? <gasps> God's not there. Well, then he's not in heaven because the streets are paved with gold. I just find it funny. Like, yeah. Have you ever thought about it, though? Like, Jesus owned two homes, had a lucrative business, and when he was born, the wedding gift was gold. I didn't get any gold. But, you know, it's amazing how Paul talks about, I believe it's in 1 Corinthians 11, or maybe it's 2 Corinthians 11, where people believe in Jesus, they think, but Paul reminds them, oh, that's a different Jesus. And I like how he still kept the name Jesus, but he said, you believe in a different Jesus. And he called them super apostles. He's using sarcasm. Oh, sorry, guys, you're the super apostles. But there's a lot of people that do believe they say in Jesus, but it's a different Jesus. There's only one Jesus. I got to get moving. 
man, I'm getting hungry today. You ever get excited when you get hungry? It's like you got something to look forward to. You know, man, I don't know what I'm going to get. That's going to make you more like, what am I going to get? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Hallelujah. The fourth angel in verse 12 blew his trumpet. And one third of the sun was struck. It's not a good day. One third of the moon and one third of the stars, and they became dark. And one third of the day was dark, and also one third of the night. You know, the judgments from the first three trumpets affected only a third part of the land and waters. But this fourth judgment, I believe, affects the entire world. And let me tell you why. Because it gets to the very source of the earth's life, energy, which is the sun. So with one-third less sunlight on the earth, there will be one-third less energy available to support the life systems of man and nature. Think about the vast changes in temperature. That will occur and how this will affect human health and food growth. Now, this is interesting, too, because it's possible that this particular judgment is only temporary for the fourth judgment or the fourth bowl judgment is a reverse. So the sun doesn't lose its energy the sun's power will be intensified. Be hot. Hotter than anybody knows. Burn people up, man. Bad day at the beach. Hmm. Think about that. Day and night's going to start changing. The sun's not going to be as powerful. And you know, Joel tells us this stuff in chapter 2. It says, sound the trumpet in Jerusalem. Raise the army on my holy mountain. Let everyone tremble in fear because the day of the Lord is upon us. It is a day of darkness and gloom, a day of thick clouds and deep blackness. Suddenly, like dawn spreading across the mountains, a great and mighty army appears. Nothing like it, has been seen before or will ever be seen again. You know, let me tell you, these trumpets, as we're about to find out, it still hasn't gotten that bad. And this is what I love. (laughs) Not only is it bad, It's not that bad. And the angels come and remind the people, oh, I'm sorry, guys. The worst is yet to come. (laughs) I didn't know if they spoke that in love, but they said, I looked and I heard a single eagle crying loudly as it flew through the air. Some translations say, whoa. Mine says, terror, terror, terror to all who belong to this world and what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets. My God. It's like when people tell you, say something nice. Was that nice? They're already losing their water. It's turned to blood. Sun's all jacked up. You know, your direct TV can't figure out where to go. And all of a sudden, this eagle <laughs> comes flying through. Tyler! 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 It, it, 
it's something. So at this point, a remarkable messenger. I mean, could this be the eagle-like living creature that John saw worshiping before the throne in Revelations 4? Maybe. But the three terrors in Revelations 8.13 refer to the judgment yet to come when the remaining three angels blow their trumpets. And, 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 and like I said, it's as this messenger is crying, if you think this is bad, just wait. The worst is yet to come. It's the opposite of a Joel Osteen message. <laughs> the opposite. <laughs> Not the best is yet to come. No. Yeah. I'm sure religious people must love this message because they don't like Joel's. The best is yet to come. Well, there's somebody coming you telling you that the best isn't yet to come. Maybe you'll say amen to that. You know, let me tell you something. I got to say this about Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen like every preacher, not like every preacher, only a few, because he's actually had national exposure. And I run into people who are like, do you like Joel Osteen? You know, I listen to his daddy a lot. Joel Osteen is doing what God's called him to do. Not everybody is called to be a prophetic voice. Not everybody's called to be a John the Baptist. But if you think about why people don't like him, the majority say he smiles too much. And people thought he's a shapeshifter because he blinks fast. <laughs> shapeshifter. <laughs> but I'm just saying, I know this. I know his sister leads a class at the church teaching people about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that's more than 90% of the other churches in our country. And I know that Dottie Olstein knows the power of healing. God healed her body. When she had cancer, she was in the hospital room and she heard a demonic spirit say, cancer. Kept telling her, just in her head. And she kept saying the name of Jesus and the voice got quieter and quieter and quieter and quieter and quieter. So there's a lot you don't see on TV, but after the cameras go off, they're laying hands on people. People are getting healed, but I just want to remind you, the majority of pastors that hate on him, hate on him because he actually sells a lot of books, and they've sold four on e-Kindle readers on Amazon. <laughs> now, there's, of course, things I know people say, well, he said, that, man, everybody makes mistakes. There's things that everybody, you know, about, well, he didn't answer this proper, properly. Well, if you, you know, put, put you on the spot, I'm not justifying anything. I'm just saying that, you know, I find it interesting that in a world that we live in, Christians, if they're, if they're not smiling, they're mean. But if they're smiling, they're too happy. Anyway. Man. We're about to close. You know, the phrase, to all who belong to the world, it means much more than the people who are living on earth. Instead, I've, I've looked it up, it refers to the kind of people. To a kind of people. Those who live for the earth and for the things of the earth. The Bible says something. Don't store up treasures down here. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. The world hates you. Well, if the way it'd love you if you were one of its own. If this world loves you, I'd check your life. If every, everybody you meet is good with you, I'd check your life. There's a great, it's a great sign when this world's disagreeing with you. If this world is agreeing with everything you say, then watch your speaking can't be Christ because the only thing they agree with is anti-Christ statements. Yeah. 
You know, at the beginning of human history, heaven and earth were united because our first parents honored and obeyed God's will. But eventually, Satan tempted them to focus on the earth. As a result, they disobeyed God, and ever since, a great gulf has been fixed between heaven and earth. But praise God, 2,000 years ago, this gap was bridged when the Son of God came and died on a cross for the sins of the world. Any sin you've ever committed, Jesus already paid for. He's not going to have to come back again and die all over again. Jesus died for the sins of all mankind. Every murderer, every thief, every robber, every gossiper, whatever. He died for the sins of all. And God was satisfied with that payment. And it's as simple as that. If you want Jesus, if you want salvation, you got to understand that you're lost, you're broken, you're sinful, you're headed to a devil's hell, and Jesus is the only one who can help you. I mean, people that say Jesus isn't real, my question is, then who else is going to take care of that demonic Dracula darkness on the inside of you? Because you know, man, you're messed up. Just me and you. I don't know none of your friends are here, but man, I know. At night, you're tormented in your mind. I mean, if money was the problem, then why are the richest people on the earth? I mean, look at the guy who had his own island. What was his name? Epstein. Had his own island. Money wasn't enough. Needed girls. But then the girls weren't enough. They needed to get younger. Sin will never satisfy you. It'll make you pay more than you got. Make you stay longer than you want to stay. Hold you captive longer than you want to be in in bound in chains. It will destroy your life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's it. Well, I don't really know. I've talked to people lived up on the hills with big mansions, didn't believe in Jesus. And I said, what about Tommy? You want me to help your boy? That's why you had me over here. He's all drugged up on heroin. Why is he taking heroin, man? If the devil's not real and God's not real, what's making him want to escape? This darkness. You know it because you've cheated on your wife two times. Trying to find something. But you can't find it. You thought it would be better. Then you started drinking. To forget about the affairs that you had. Hoping that you could take enough to get the courage to tell your wife what you did. But then you all that, you weren't even there for your own daughter. She got pregnant at 16. Because daddy was too busy trying to fix his own stuff. What are you trying to fix? There's no evil. There's no good. We're just here. And then we're gone. Why does your son lash out at you? You say in a voice that you can't describe. It's not his own. What's in him? Or the demons that I've encountered in people that were cast out was what got cast out? What was it that made that man that was beating his wife melt like butter 
as I laid my hands on him. And after that day, never touched his wife again. What, what, what broke off that hardened, outer surface on his heart? When I walked in and saw that teenager laying there that was brain dead, and I prayed the prayer of faith over him, what made him get up? What about that baby? You called me down, three days old. They said, your baby's going to die. I came down and laid my hands on your baby, and he is alive today. You're not in the church anymore. You can use me, that's fine. But the Lord's the one using me. But who's doing it? Is it coincidence? How could a man sitting on an island 2,000 years ago read about these things that are almost verbatim of what the World Economic Forum are saying today. I'm going to tell you, there was a time I said, well, if I'm, if I'm wrong, you ain't got nothing to lose. If I'm right, you got everything to lose. I don't say that anymore. All I say is, I'm right. I know I'm right because I know God's word. What am I feeling? What's moving through my veins? What's this fire that I feel? Why can I start speaking in another tongue and people ask me, how many languages do you speak? Can I babble around and fool people with college degrees? Oh no. I'm going to tell you what it is. There's a God in heaven and he calls you by name. He knows the number of hairs that are on your head. You can cuss them out, but his thoughts towards you are more than the sand on the seashore. Oh, you can stomp on his name, but he still dances over mine. We have a God in heaven that will set you free. Oh, if you're bound and tormented by depression, if you find sickness in your body, but more importantly, if you're on your way to a devil's hell and you say, there's something in me that I can't get rid of. I've been trying. I've used everything I can, every drug, every drink, every person, but it's still this dark, cold plague. Let me tell you what it is. It's sin and God can free you from the power of sin and death. John G. Lake was in Africa and he was praying over people who were infected with the bubonic plague. The bubonic plague would have made COVID-19 look like Skittles. You got it, you died. He didn't have a mask on when he walked into Africa. And they started asking him, Brother Lake, why aren't you and the people with you dying? Everybody else around you is dying. This is a documented fact, a medical fact. They took him into a lab They took a saliva swab out of a patient where that bubonic plague had just decayed him. They put the virus on his hand under a microscope and said the moment that virus hit his hand, it died. And they said, Brother Lake, as they were zipped up in their airtight suits, we don't understand. He said, but I understand. The law of the Spirit of Christ has freed me from the law of sin and death. There is a law that is in the Spirit. And if you will abide by the law of the Spirit of Christ, it will free you from the law of sin and death. Sin and death. You can look in the face and say, Death, where is your sting? You can kill me but I shall reign supreme in Jesus' name. Oh, I'm telling you, we serve 
a great and mighty God.